As she said, I'm Jane Davis. I'm currently a user researcher at Dropbox. I've been there for about a week and a half. So naturally, I left in my second week to take three days off. <laughs> so uh, I was previously at BitTorrent. Before that, I was at JSTOR. And I'm here to talk to you about user research for non-researchers because I enjoy putting myself out of work. So quick show of hands or just you know, a little thumbs up if you don't like to raise your hand in public. How many of you have asked a friend or a family member or a coworker or colleague for feedback on a project you're working on? Great. Have you ever had someone look at something you're working on just so you have a fresh set of eyes? You ever IM'd someone with a question about a project you're trying to work on? Great, you've all done user research and this is the quickest talk of the day. <laughs> All right, you probably want to know a little bit more. So I've still got a few things to cover, but my point is that user research doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be time consuming or expensive. It doesn't have to take place in a lab or involve fancy software. All you need are two things, a really good question and real live human beings. So let's start with a question. This is incredibly important. Before you even consider talking to people, you need to know what your question actually is. You need to be able to state in two lines or fewer what that question is. And until you have it, you're not ready to do research. So this sounds a little weird, right? Like, the research is the question. The software is the question. The question is the question. What do you mean what the question actually is? So to illustrate, I'm going to share with you a few of my favorite quotes from my career as a researcher. We want to know what users want. What's wrong with our product? What do people like? And my personal favorite, just do the research and we'll figure out what to do with it afterwards. <laughs> this is real quotes from my tenure as a researcher. None of these are useful questions. They might seem like useful questions, but that's because they're couched in an aura of usefulness, like this cat in a shark costume. So let's take them one by one. We want to know what users want. Interesting. Do you know who your users are? Are all your users the exact same type? Do they all have the same goals? In 2010, and feel free to giggle or judge me for this, I was a member of the Burning Man Temple crew. And we worked out of a warehouse in Oakland called American Steel, which was conveniently located extremely near Home Depot. And so it was extremely convenient. 24-hour Home Depot. So, and in the shop, of course, we had this running list on our whiteboard that was just labeled what we want from the hardware store. And one night, well after midnight, I walked up to that list, and I was feeling a little punchy, and I wrote Rocket Pony. So it became kind of a running joke, but we also relabeled the list to what we need from the hardware store. People like me ruin everything. <laughs> but you know what the thing is? I did want a rocket pony. I still want a rocket pony. I don't even know what a rocket pony is, but it sounds sweet and I want one. Maybe more than one. Until I find out that they only eat Francium and they hum atonally all day long, and they only run on Gen 2. Wow. Wow. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so the gulf between wanting something in theory and actually liking it after you have it can be quite wide. It's important to remember that when you get your rocket pony. So the first problem with asking people what they want is that when you ask us what we want, we don't consider the consequences of that. We don't know what we'll do after we get it. The second problem is that people, all of us, myself included, are terrible at predicting our future behavior. If you ask me right now what I'm gonna do tomorrow, I would say I'm gonna wake up, and I'm gonna drink some coffee, and I'm gonna go for a run, and I'm gonna write to my grandmother, and I'm gonna get my niece a birthday present, and fix my parents' Wi-Fi, and cook a healthy dinner. Am I actually gonna do all those things? Probably not, but you don't know that. As a side note, every time I worked on this talk, I was racked with guilt because I still hadn't written to my grandmother. I was like, I'm the worst granddaughter. So the thing is, 
I might actually do all those things. I might do any one of those things or some combination of those things. Or I might read mysteries for eight straight hours and have mac and cheese for dinner. You don't know that. And most importantly, neither do I. Until you've seen someone in the moment, you don't know what they're going to do in that moment. So once you accept that people are extremely poor at predicting their future behavior, then you can worry about what they did yesterday. That's what we want to focus on in user research. What have you already done? The next question, what's wrong with it? This sounds reasonable, right? We want to know what's wrong with the stuff we build. If we don't know what's wrong with it, we can't fix it. I once interviewed one of our users at a company that shall remain nameless because this is a pretty gnarly story. Um, but I once interviewed a guy, and he was complaining about a UI update we had pushed out. And he was saying, it's too simple. And when I asked him what he would prefer, he gave me this. This is a World of Warcraft UI. And he said, I want all of the information that's available to me in front of me. I want it all on my screen. He also told me he wanted it in neon text on a black background. And I said, I too, sir, miss the 90s. <laughs> But the thing here is, I don't do this to make fun of this guy. We shouldn't be making fun of this guy. We shouldn't be judging him for this. That meets his needs perfectly. It is what, he's pref it's what he prefers. But for him, a simple UI is something wrong with our product, something wrong with what we've built. For someone else, the World of Warcraft UI is going to be exactly what would be wrong. So the point is, wrong is extremely subjective. You can't go by one or two users telling you what's wrong, because what's wrong for them doesn't necessarily fit what's wrong for all your users. So instead, what we need to focus on is where users struggle. It's where they stumble. It's where they fail. And it's where they succeed. It's where they have those little moments where they think, this just fit my needs perfectly. I liked this experience. Wrong isn't going to tell us anything about that. What do people like? People like puppies. People like kittens. People like small, fluffy things. But I'll tell you what. If you walk up to some random stranger on the street and try to hand them one, things get weird really fast. <laughs> so don't ask people what they want. <laughs> don't ask people what they like. Even if we narrow this to what do people like about this specific thing, it doesn't tell us anything useful. It doesn't tell us what we need to know. What are we going to do with that information when we get it? Unless you are prepared to make changes or decisions based on the information you get there, don't ask the question. Whether or not someone likes something is immaterial. Does it meet their needs? Does it allow them to accomplish what they're trying to without getting in their way? It doesn't matter if they like it. Whether it actually works for them is the criteria. Criterion, for those of you who really care about those things. This is my favorite. Just do the research, and we'll figure out what to do with it afterwards. No, no, never. Not even once. We do research with purpose. We do research with intention. We do research with goals and with a clear focus in mind. Fitting the question to the data is the way of hucksters and charlatans and professional polling agencies. It is not our way. OK, what questions do we ask? I am so glad you asked, because that is a great question. Here are the marks of a good research question. The scope is specific to the project. Everyone understands what information we're trying to get from it. It can be easily summed up in a sentence or two. It takes into account what we already know. And most importantly, it will be used in the immediate future to make decisions or changes. I cannot stress that one enough. 
unless the research you're doing is going to be put to some practical and immediate purpose, you should wait to do research. Your time is valuable. <laughs> Never forget that. I love doing research for the sake of doing research. I love doing it for the sheer joy of finding out how people work. But it's a huge waste of my time and energy. So let's go back over our bad questions and see what we can do to fix them. We're going to run our questions through this handy dandy question adjuster machine. I know it looks a lot like Dr. Seuss's star-bellied sneech machine, but I assure you that's a coincidence. So question one, we want to know what our users want. So let's adjust this. We want to know the top two things users want to accomplish when they're using this and whether or not they're successful. This is specific to our project. This is easily understandable in terms of our goals for what we're going to find out from this research. And we've summed it up in one sentence. If we have previous information, we're going to bring that in and we're going to base off of that. And we're going to use that information about whether or not users are successful to either get out of their way and let them keep working if they are, or make adjustments if they're failing at those top two things. What's wrong with it? So let's adjust. Are there points in this workflow where new users are struggling or failing? This is specific to one type of user. It's easily scoped. We know that we'll come out of this with information that we need to make decisions about the costs and benefits of actually fixing those points. And we're going to make an informed decision based off this research. Question three, what do people like? All right, let's move this to, would this feature help users accomplish what they're trying to do? So let's say we have a new idea. Let's say we've got this, this new button we want to include in our UI. We want to know whether that button's actually going to be used by people or whether it's just going to be cluttering things up. That's a great point to do user research. You have something concrete to present to users and say, will this help you? Will this be something you need. Question four, just do the research and we'll figure out what to do with it afterwards. There's no way to make this into a question because it's not a question. This is just someone telling you to waste your time and energy. Be like the nope octopus and glide away on your freakishly capable tentacles. <laughs> so now that we know when not to do research and what kind of research questions we should and shouldn't be asking, Let's move on to getting people to let you do research. This can be surprisingly difficult, and I say that as someone who is paid to do research. So the biggest thing, this is going to sound crazy, the biggest thing you can do is be really excited about research. This isn't going to be everyone's best method, but when I was at BitTorrent, I got there and there were all these people who were really skeptical about what I think of as kind of squishy research which is talking to six people when you have 170 million users and trying to convince engineers that you can make conclusions based on that. The numbers seem crazy. I fully realize that. And I'm here to tell you, it is OK to be skeptical about that stuff. But the biggest thing you can do is just be excited. When I got to BitTorrent, I was yelling in the hallways about how much I loved research and how great it was. I was walking around just constantly singing about how wonderful research is and all the cool things you can find out. And you know what? It worked. It actually worked. I was very surprised, but it was awesome. Being a cheerleader works. Teams that had never done research started to talk to me about maybe talking to some humans. Teams that had a regular research routine started coming to me and saying, oh, is there other types of research maybe we could be doing? Like, people actually started to believe in the value of research because that was all I would talk about with them for about six months. I was an incredibly boring person to have at your lunch table. <laughs> but I wound up doing a lot of research, and it was great. So there's nothing wrong with just being a cheerleader. 
but maybe that's not your style. That's also okay. Not everyone likes yelling. I personally love it, and it's kind of how I prefer to spend my days, but if you are not the kind of person who is going to walk through the hallways yelling about how great user research is, that's cool. I have tools for you. So, science. Science is your friend. There are so many studies out there that have already been done that will show you how many problems you can find through usability testing with just five people. It's like the famous number they give you. Nielsen did a study that was basically like, after five people, you stop finding, you know, you found 95% of usability issues. It's a great number as a target number for usability testing. It's, you know, it's a good jumping off point and it's a great study to show people because it says in five people we will find nearly every problem with this. Show them the science. It's, it works really well because that's how people think a lot of times. If you're used to approaching problems logically, if you're used to approaching problems with sort of that engineering mindset, you want to know that there will be a concrete useful effect to talking to five people about your 170 million user piece of software. So I like to try science. The other way you can do this approach is just sit someone down and have them watch five minutes of a research video, just a research session. Watch someone struggle with piece of software because there is nothing like the evidence of your eyes to show you that research is actually valuable in that respect. The you're not my supervisor approach is another one I've done quite a lot. And I'd just like to make one quick disclaimer here. Please don't do this if the person in question is your supervisor. It's, it doesn't go well. Learn from what I've tried. <laughs> So one way to avoid all the back and forth about whether or not to do research is just to jump in and start doing the research. Now, this approach has mixed results. If you're confident that you're going to be able to convince people after the fact that the research you've got is valuable and should be used to make changes and decisions, just go for it. Just, just skip all the conversations about whether or not to do research. But otherwise, if you're faced with extremely skeptical people, you're just going to wind up having the same conversation after you've spent all the time doing the research. So when you're using this one, be mindful that unless you're personally in the position to make the changes and decisions, or unless you're reasonably confident that you'll be able to convince someone about it, it you might be better off with one of the other approaches. It's hard to go wrong with science. The mystery box, this is my favorite approach. This is the one I use probably most frequently to the best results. So I once made a deal with a product manager and I said, I want to usability test this product. If you let me and you don't get anything at all out of the research, I will never talk to you about user research again. Never again. Now, he could have just said no to doing research and there was effectively nothing I could have done anyway. But I gave him the mystery box. And I said, maybe, maybe you'll get something even better if you just let me do this one thing. Humans are huge suckers for the mystery box. I do this all the time. And it's a really powerful thing to draw on simply because You've piqued their curiosity, and you've also showed how confident you are in that this research is going to be valuable. You're saying, I will never, ever bother you again about research if we don't find at least one thing. I am so confident that this research is going to be valuable that I'll just stop doing my job for you. <laughs> so if all else fails, try the mystery box. Now. So we've got a couple ways to convince people. We know how to ask questions. And before we jump into methodology, I just want to pause for a quick 
moment to talk about how we actually find people to talk to. It drives me crazy when I go to research talks and they don't give you any actual practical information. So here's how you find people to talk to. If you want to talk to your users, ideally you have forums or a mailing list or a support alias where people reach you. Use those, leverage those things. Like go on the forums and be like, hey, we're looking for users to test a you know, new feature or we just want to talk to you and find out more about who you are. If you've got a mailing list, randomly select a segment of it. Don't go off about it, just randomly select, I promise. Just avoid introducing bias. Um, leverage your mailing lists, leverage your forums, leverage any instance where you're actually talking to users. But if you want to talk to random strangers, this is much harder in certain ways. So there are services, Ethneo is for $49, they will actually recruit people for you. You tell them what you're looking for and for 50 bucks, you get six or seven people that actually fit the profile of the people you're trying to talk to. It's a great, really fast way to recruit and I highly recommend it. The other option is posting on Craigslist in your area. It costs 25 bucks. You just say, hey, we're looking for people. Go fill out this screener. And if they meet your criteria that you've put up there, then talk to them. As a side note, if you are talking, if you're putting it out to users that you're trying to find people to talk to, if someone offers and you don't select them, try to remember to send them a thank you note. I'm pretty bad about this, but just try to, you know, thank them for volunteering, ask if they're willing to be contacted in the future. It's never too early to start building your research participant database. So just things to think about as you're going through this. The third and most terrifying way is to walk out your door and start talking to people. Just walk up to people and say, hey, do you have an hour this week to sit down with a product and tell me what you think of it? This, uh, this approach sounds terrifying and sometimes it is because talking to new people is extremely frightening for me and most others. But chances are they're gonna wanna help you. People are pretty great that way. It also builds a lot of character. So, how do we choose, right? All right, we have a million different research methodologies. And, and have you ever seen a child actually surrounded by a pile of candy? And they're just like paralyzed in the middle of it, not eating anything? This is how I feel with research. So, so your research method, I'm gonna cover just three that are gonna be the fastest, highest impact, options for you when you're doing research as a non-researcher. Um, but there are tons out there and when you start reading up on it, you can kind of get that choice paralysis that comes from it. So we're gonna focus on how your research question determines what methodology you use. If your question is exploratory, if you just wanna know a little bit more about your users, if you're trying to figure out if there's actually going to be, you know, an audience for an idea you have, then you want to do ethnography. This is essentially just sitting down with people and talking to them. It's really fun. You learn a lot of weird stuff. Um, if you've got a more specific feature or item you want, or product or project you want to test, usability testing. It's real simple. Five people do it all in one day, and you find almost all of your issues. And then. Gorilla usability testing is, I know, it's my favorite though. I love gorilla usability testing, but you do have to talk to a lot of weird strangers. Um, but if you have something small, something like just a workflow or a set of screenshots or even just some icons that you wanna get feedback on, gorilla usability testing, you'll be done in half a day. It's bam, feedback. It's my favorite because it's so fast and you get instant results. All right, uh, even if you, you should be paying your research participants. Every once in a while I start a new job and they're like, oh, but we'll just, no, pay them, pay them. Uh, five or $10 gift card is great. If you're asking them to sit with you for more than half an hour, 25 or $50 Amazon gift cards, just incredible. Otherwise, 
if you offer things like access to your project or access to the latest version of your project or a subscription to your software, you're introducing bias. You're already going to be only finding the people who are most interested in that incentive. Plus, they're more likely to feel ne to, you know, be hesitant to say negative things about your product, which defeats the entire purpose. All right, ethnography. Ethnography is a great way to find out vast, rich information about what people do, how they behave and just generally how they move through the world. And it consists of one simple question. Tell me what you did yesterday. Now, this is going to spur a long description of someone's schedule, and that's when you start asking the more specific questions. Have some goals in mind for this. If you really do just want to know how people move through the world, tell me, about, tell me what you did yesterday is the perfect question. But you probably have other things you'd like to find out, like what kind of devices do these people use? What sort of apps do they have installed on their phone? So any time that something like that gets brought up, just say, Can we, could you expand on that just a little bit? So have some goals in mind when you're doing ethnography. When you're sitting down with people, just have some ideas about the kinds of behaviors you want to learn about or the kinds of needs that you want to hear about. And then you can tease that out throughout the course of the interview. These usually take 30 to 60 minutes, and you wind up with notes, just pages of notes. And you find out more about people, which I always think is wonderful. So usability testing, it's important. Um, if you've got a more concrete problem, like whether or not people are actually succeeding in what they're trying to do with your software, usability testing is the best possible option for that. As I said, five people takes one day, and you're going to see a lot of struggle and ideally a lot of areas where you can improve your usability. It's also incredibly difficult to sit and watch someone use something that you designed or built and not help them and you have to not help them. I'm sorry. You can't do anything that leads them. You have to sit there, and if they're failing over and over, you just have to watch them fail. And they will ask you questions, and they will say, am I doing this right? And you will have to sit silently with a pleasant smile on your face. And it'll suck, and I'm sorry. But it'll build character. All research builds character. I have so much character, you wouldn't believe. So, <laughs> but, it, I, but it's true, it defeats the point. If you are going to answer their questions or help them through your software, you're not going to find where your software is actually getting in their way. Guerrilla usability testing. All right, this is, as I said, my favorite. It's a subset of usability testing, but it's also, to me, a very different animal. Eh, get it? Uh, so, guerrilla testing requires that you actually go out into the world and you talk to random strangers. And you walk up to them and you say, hey, do you have five minutes in exchange for this $5 Starbucks gift card or Amazon gift card to help me find out what's wrong with this or to give me feedback? I tend to do this in large tourist areas in San Francisco or wherever I happen to be testing. That way you get people from all over the country and all over the world. So tourist areas are your friend for this. Probably you want to talk to as many people as you can. I go with five to 10. More than that, and I get pretty exhausted because it's very tiring talking to strangers. Know your limits with that. Like If you are starting to feel hunched up and just done, don't talk to anyone else. That's really going to impact your interviews. That affect is going to be pretty detrimental. So I also recommend bringing at least one other person with you. This isn't so much for your safety, although it is for your safety because I worry about that, but it's mostly so that you'll actually follow through on going out and doing the testing. Unless I bring someone with me, and I do this for a living, unless I bring someone with me and tell them I'm about to go gorilla test, I just 
will not follow through on it. So bring someone with you when you're guerrilla testing. Go up to random strangers, ask them for feedback. It's going to be great. So we've composed our research question. We've corrected our terrible research questions. We figured out what kind of research we're going to do and how we find people to talk to and who we're going to talk to. Now, let's talk about how we talk to those people. I've just got a couple quick tips. I've got a resources slide at the end with a long article about perform, like, essentially just better, getting better feedback in interviews through body language and through your behavior. So I recommend checking that out. But a couple things I want to hammer home. Always be focused on the participant. This means there are no computers open in the room that aren't in front of your research participant. Ideally, you've got someone else in there who can take notes. If you're conducting the interview, never be taking notes. If you have to, record it and go back and take those notes later. But you want your attention focused completely on your research participant. You also don't want to make them feel self-conscious by all of a sudden they say something and immediately you go to write it down. That really interrupts the flow of their behavior. And you want to try for as natural a behavior as you can in what is fundamentally a very awkward and contrived setting. So I know, research is basically the Stone Ages. You're just going to have to embrace the hand cramps and learn to read your own handwriting again. All right, be friendly, but not leading. I have like seven different monkey rodeo slides on my computer, by the way. I use a different one in every deck. Um, so be friendly, but not leading. Pretend your participant is this goat. You don't want to herd them, and I'm really stretching with this analogy, I know. But you don't want to herd them in the direction of where they're trying to go with their software. You want them to show you how they would naturally move through it. Don't be like the monkey on the dog, no matter how tiny a saddle you find. Maintain a neutral, slightly positive affect. This one is so much harder than it sounds. So just outside of this session, alone in a room, Practice keeping a slight smile on your face. Now practice doing that for an hour at a time. You're going to be great. <laughs> Talk less. I'm a very talkative person. I don't know if that's coming across through this, but I love the sound of my own voice. I love to hear myself speak. I probably could have picked a career that is better suited to those traits of mine, but here we are. The general rule is you should be doing less than 20% of the talking in a session. If you are doing more than that, you need to step back and stop. The only things that you should be saying are de should be designed to get more information from people. So tell me about what you're seeing right here. Talk to me a little bit more about that. Have a list of those questions that will prompt your participants and just go through them and then cycle through at the top again. They won't notice, I promise. Before you do anything, once we've conducted our research, observations, not conclusions. Everything you report to someone else should be in the form of an observation. Because if you go to a research skeptic, and you say, oh, this is what we saw, this is what it means, all of a sudden you're starting the debate about the research all over again. You want to go to them and say, this is what we saw, and then have the discussion about what it means. You might think you've got the perfect solution to a feature that you saw fail over and over again in usability testing, but I assure you, you will be able to find someone who disagrees with you. So present observations. Think about your research like a tree you just cut down. This is going to be another analogy stretch. You're welcome. Um, so our job is to whittle this tree, our observations, into this majestic bear, our conclusions. If you've got, I know, I'm sorry. That was really, I just wanted to get chainsaw carving in there. Um, I'm from the Midwest. It happens. So if you've got other people helping you conduct your research sessions, then have a five-minute debrief after every one. And you just sit down, you talk about what you saw, what you think it means, and just take some quick notes on that. 
If you're flying solo, this is a little harder. You want to sit down and you want to distill everything you've just learned from all of the research you've just done into three bullet points. Three. It's the semi-magic number for getting people to actually read the email when you send it out to them. If at all possible, have these meetings face to face. But really, you want to go in there with your research distilled down to three actionable items. This gets back to what we talked about with the questions at the beginning. You want to be able to use this information. The rest of the notes you can have, you can just hold on to them for the next time that something comes up where you need information about it. But really, three bullet points is going to be more than enough for you to go on and probably provide almost a year's worth of work depending on what you've seen. All right. As I said, face to face. I know. You want to do this face to face. How you do it in face to face settings is up to you. I am a huge fan of the interpretive dance as research methodology communication. Um, you do you. But it's, it's also easier to spur a discussion that way. That way you can actually start sussing out your conclusions. If you absolutely must, at the end of the day, if nobody is willing to sit down and actually talk to you about the research, send out an email with those three bullet points we talked about and then go pester them in person if it's possible. So let's tie it all together. Think back to the beginning of this talk, to those many words ago, when you were thinking of a time when you asked a colleague or a friend or a family member for feedback. Think about what question you'd ask them now. Think about the way you'd ask it. Think about who you'd ask it to. What sort of research would you do if you wanted to ask it to more people? How would you communicate your answer to other people? Every time you have a question about your work, think through those things. Once you've done that, you're ready to do research. You're now ready to do research. <laughs> <laughs>